that um, I, I know everything. When the siren goes off in, in, the, in their town, I, I wake up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't forget. All right. Whatever you find is convenient. All right. How's that? Can all the Zoom folks hear me? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Marianne. Do we need a couple more chairs? We just about filled the seat. This is great. Yeah. Okay. All right. I need my gavel, so I'm I'm going to use my outdoor voice or my teacher voice or something. Attention, Attention on deck. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, welcome everyone. It's good to have everyone here tonight. It's great to see a live crowd. I know. I love this. Um, we have about eight folks out on our, our Zoom burst out there. So, uh, Ted, you, you brought them all out for the big presentation. <laughs> all right. Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Karen Davis, and I am the publications director and the communications director for the club. But either one of those jobs are up for grabs, if anyone would like to step in for next year. Um, it's, uh, it's good to see everyone here. And we have a, a wonderful big announcement tonight because our president, our new CCR president, is going to kick things off and start the meeting for us tonight. So it's my pleasure. I get to introduce uh, Martin Evans. He is going to, I think we have a little PowerPoint. Yeah, well, he's here. 30 yes. seconds. Yeah, and we need a VP. Yeah, yeah. so um, we're looking for volunteers. Just because I, I didn't know everybody here, I thought I would give you some background on who I am and what I'm doing here, I guess. Um, I did blood vessel surgery for 40 years, and none of those skills spilled over, over to photography. So in contrast to there are some people who do digital imaging of humans, and they get the benefit of having their knowledge spill over to photography. Blood vessel vascular surgery doesn't spill anything. And so the answer is, be careful what you wish for. And I got tired of everybody. I would hear from some of my breakfast buddies that I have breakfast with on a weekly basis. You know, we don't have a, a president of camera club. And I said, well, why did not somebody do this? Well, the answer is that they get intimidated about the position. And I said, okay, I'm honored to do that. I'll, I'll do it. All right. Um, I, then, but you have to be careful what you wish for. This is an intimidating group. There are great pictures that are taken in this group. Uh, it is, as president, you'd like to think, well, I'm going to be better than, all. no. The answer is, I'm not the best photographer here. I'm happy to be a player here, but I'm not going to be the one, your resource to go to and say, what should I do with it? Mm, no, I'm just like you are. I say this a lot. Um, photography is a solo sport. The nice thing about a camera group is share your knowledge with others because uh, it, because it's a solo sport, you tend to think if somebody copies you, then you're losing your individuality. No, that's not what it is. It's just be every day's a school day. You ought to share something with somebody that screws up something that's standing beside you, you know, you might think about turning it this way or that way. And that's what the evaluations are for. But also, if you see somebody that you can help, I say help them out. And this is the one that I think is really pertinent here. Continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection. That is, don't wait to go take a picture. Go do it. And the next one will be better than the last one. And I think that's valuable in a group like this. So share your knowledge, make it not be a total solo sport, and you'll get more out of the whole process. It is a lot more fun to go take pictures with someone who uh, gets a thrill out of the same thing as you do, at, rather than trying to go out by yourself and figure it out. 
So in answer to all of that, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we have one guest uh, named Lily Liu. Lily. Thanks so much for coming, Lily, and we'll hope to see more of you. We have new members that are listed here. Um, and this is the kind of format I hope to be able to use throughout the year. Um, the VP notes, end of year awards, we just uh, uh, had the, the uh, judging of that. But the award ceremony, just as a reminder, is Tuesday, December 5. If you've not sent in your RSVP, please do that. I will be in um, Cuba, so have a good time. I'll hear about it. <laughs> um, these are things that are sent in from the board members and for Joe Rings. Uh, is this still on? Where did I see Joe? Still on? Everything still go? Okay. Great. Um, Karen, you want to say anything about the survey? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your ideas on assigned subjects. What happens is that the board will meet in December, and we will pick three out of those 80 to be our assigned subject for next year. So, you know, buckle up. It's, there are some really interesting ones that, uh, that came in. Um, and then I, I'll talk about publications too a little bit. Newsletter always comes out on the first of the month. So please, please, if you don't get it, let me know. Google is kind of glitchy sometimes. So if you don't get that newsletter on the first of the month, be sure to shoot me a message. So keep your eyes open. There may be some more surveys coming too. If you don't get it, Exactly. Yep. Terry's really good about putting that up on the web. All kinds of stuff out there on the web. So use, use the website. I wanted to show, um, I attended the judging and that was an interesting process for sure. Um, you know what happens, but until you sit there and watch it, you don't really know. It's an interesting process. Um, th these were the entries, 425 entries on 22. Uh, this year, one less. Um, 125 wild cards, 46 prints, et cetera. But a huge volume of stuff to go through and some really spectacular images for sure. Um Expert 82, Advanced 214, and Novice 128. Uh, I, a pretty well-rounded group and, and certainly um, a lot of fun to watch the whole thing. Um, exhibits VCU Health uh, is up through 20, uh, 124, Capital One, as you see. Um, we've seen that. And thanks to the judges, it, it was um, interesting because Fred, I saw here. Yep. Thank you, Fred and Jesse and Wolfgang were there. And, um, you know, for the, for the player watching this and you hear the dialogue, you want to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. That one's not that good. But you can't do that. So, <laughs> but it, it really takes some restraint to listen to their dialogue and to see what is interesting to the judges. So uh, I don't know how to, whether we should record that, whether we uh, want to share that, but I think we may get some comments from Fred at the banquet about the judge's perspective and will be, it'll be very interesting to, to hear that. Uh, leadership team, I hear that we're supposed to have a formal vote on these positions. And so uh, I would say unless there are objections or write-ins or whatever, if I can hear a uh, those in favor, any opposed, be careful what you wish for if you want. <laughs> any nominations? Yep. 
we'll do some arm twisting later. All right, tonight, uh, Ted is going to talk about uh, African safaris. And one of the intro things I thought I would put up in, uh, in regard to that is, if you don't know about Africa, you should. Look at the space of Africa that it really, you can put China, India, Eastern Europe, the United States, Italy, Germany, France, et cetera, all in the footprint of Africa. So it is really, really huge. And I don't, certainly I did not have that appreciation uh, before going. And um, Ted is going to share some of that same um, dialogue, but it's pretty big and much bigger than one would think. Uh, regarding uh, our featured speaker, I thought I'd put just a few little things. He's only been a photographer seriously for 10 years, and um, but he's traveled a, uh, last year in eight countries, this year in 10 countries. He likes HDR. He had a career in tech and travel, and his um, curriculum vitae or resume if you listed all the places you've been, it'd probably be here till next week. So uh, I think we're very grateful to have him stop by Richmond. And, uh. <laughs> and I look forward to hearing what he has to say. Ted, it's all yours. Great. Thank you. First off, I want to thank the board and Karen for inviting me to um, make this presentation. Um, I would like this to be interactive. Um, like Martin said, I'm not the best photographer. You're going to see some things up here that you think, well, that's pretty, pretty nice. And some things you go, well, I could have done better than that. But my whole purpose of this is to, I had a number of people actually come up to me and say, hey, I want to do a safari. How do I do that? How do, how do I go about booking it? Where should I go? How long should I stay? Um, so I've tried to incorporate that in tonight's presentation. I, Try to start from you're thinking of going on a safari. Now, what do you have to think of? So that's that's what we're going to go through. And then eventually I'm going to go into what we did in our safari. You're going to see some pictures. You're going to see some videos. And I'll probably tell you some stories of things that happened to us. Some fun, not so fun, while we were out in the Serengeti and Savannah. So there's a number of you that could be giving this presentation. There's a number of you that have done safaris. Um, you have some wonderful photos out there, and I'm jealous of them. But here we go. You have a lot of places you can go. You have South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Botswana, Zimbabwe. And all these places are different. They may have the big five, the big five being the elephants, the Cape buffalo, the lions, uh, rhinos, leopards. Or they may just have... Elephants, and they have uh, wart, uh, wart hogs. I always call them hog warts. I'm a Harry Potter fan. So, so you you really have to start thinking about what do I want to see. Uh, if you want to see gorillas, you're going to go to Rwanda. If you want to? Uh, I'm not sure there's gorillas anywhere else, but Rwanda to me was a uh, place you go for gorillas. Yes, sir. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at my uh, screen here. That's going to mess me up. All right. So who do you want to go with? There's. I would not recommend trying to do this on your own, hire your own guide. I think you need to go with the tour operator. Some of them that you can go with are Abercrombie and Kent, Hawk, Hobson Safaris, Go to Africa, Wild Eye, uh, Extraordinary Journeys. Or you can go with the pro photographers. There's a lot of pro photographers that actually take groups over to Africa and have wonderful safaris. Um, I don't know. Some of you may follow Christopher Palmer and Kevin Dooley. They are wonderful. Um, how long do you want to stay? You can go four or five days. You can go three weeks. You stayed three weeks, didn't you? Like that. And your price point, how much do you want to pay? There, it can be from several thousand dollars to 
tens of thousands of dollars. So you have to think all, all that through. Um, we selected talc and, and we selected them because we had a previous experience with them. We went with them to China. We stayed there for three and a half weeks. There are some places in the world we don't feel comfortable booking on our own. Um, China was one of those. Um, China was one of them, and Africa was one of those. And we also have done uh, Israel and Jordan with uh, talk. So we, we, we like them. Uh, we went, my wife wanted to choose talk because it wasn't 100% photography. She goes, I don't want to sit there for three hours and you photograph one monkey. Like, oh, no, <laughs> it's not going to be like that, although I understand why she said that. So I've done that with buffalo and eagles and all sorts of things. And previously, my wife had trekked uh, Kilimanjaro and uh, uh, Meru. And um, she wanted to go back. That was in Tanzania. So she wanted to go back to the area because she, she had a wonderful experience. Uh, our costs included all of our hotels, uh, our meals, our safari guides, our gratuities, transfers to and from the airport. Uh, we actually flew between the different um, safari locations um at private planes we have you ever taken off from a dirt runway and landed on a dirt runway we haven't that was our first time and there were a number of times when you're coming in on the dirt runway they got to buzz the runway because there's giraffes out there there's impalas there might be who knows what out there so they come they buzz they get the animals off the runway and then they land that's a new experience for me so uh, it, it, it was good. I have a video of them coming to pick us up and they're buzzing the uh, runway, but I did not include that in this. Uh, the cost did not include our flights to and from Africa. Uh, we got there early and it did not include a uh, independent safari that we booked on our own. We actually flew into Arusha. And you can see here are, are basically, uh, we got there early. We did Karen Gaia, Karen here. Yes, we went there. And that was our pre safari. And then the other ones were actually uh, coordinated through talk. Uh, when we flew into Arusha during, towards the end of COVID, we actually had to have a, what is it, PCR. They had to take a PCR to show that you didn't have COVID before you came over, show them your PCR. Then they took um, Betty and I into our room. We got our little COVID test. Um, the guy dismissed Betty, told her to go wait in the waiting room, which was a little unusual. And then he looked at me and he goes, you know, times are really tough over here in, the, in, in Tanzania. And I got six kids. So um, ended up giving them $20, which I later found out was 10% of a month's salary for uh, somebody living there. So I hope he took the family out to a uh, nice chicken dinner uh, that evening. So. It's called bak bakshish, which is, which is a tip or a bribe or whatever you want to call it. So, uh, so anyways, we, we did um, Nagora Gora, which was wonderful, Serengeti, Amboseli, Sweetwaters, uh, Maasai, and then we left out of Nairobi. Uh, we went to Lake Manyara, and that was our first day with talk. And this is actually our view from our room in Arusha. This is Mount Meru. This is where uh, my wife actually trekked this when uh, she went to uh, Tanzania uh, a number of years before we got there. Um, the morning, it was gorgeous. We saw this every day. Um, what did I take over? This is my camera bag. I took way too many lenses. I had a, I had just switch, switched to Olympus from Nikon. My Nikon D850 was very heavy. I was tired of carrying around a heavy camera, so I went to the mirrorless. And I took the a uh, 300 millimeter um, Olympus cameras, the our micro four thirds. So the 300 millimeter is equivalent to a 600 millimeter 
lens on on a, a big Nikon or a big Canon. Um, I had a forty to one fifty. I had a twenty to a twelve to one hundred. Uh, you can go through that. I had a wide lens, wide angle lens, I had teleconverter. I used my 300 millimeter um, about 35% of the time. My go to was my 40 to 150, which is really 80 to 300. But I put the teleconverter on that. Um, the 12 to 100, I used a little bit. I never used my wide angle. I had visions of going out at night, being in the dark being in the jungle and taking all these Milky Way shots of the skies and you know the trees in the foreground and maybe some animals. Didn't happen. It was cloudy every night and they would not let us go out of our hotel rooms by ourselves. In the Serengeti, when we went from the lobby to our rooms, which were down these walkways, they accompanied us with guns because leopards sometimes come in and sit in the trees. So... So I never used my wide angle. Um, I used my converter, uh, like I said. I used my iPhone a lot. I use my iPhone for video, and I'm not a videographer, but there are many times when we were very close to the animals. We'd be in our, our Jeep, our safari Jeep, and we'd have elephants right next to us, uh, four or five feet away. We have lions walk right by our uh, safari Jeeps. So, I mean, that that was not, I had to use my iPhone. I mean, I couldn't use my 300 to get something that was that close. What did I do right? What did I do wrong? What maybe you can learn from me. Uh, number one, I had plenty of lenses, way too many lenses. A lot of lens wipes. Um, it's dusty out there. When you're going through the Savannah, the Serengeti, you're going through all these back roads. There's all this dust that's kicking up. You got to protect your lenses. And a lot of times you get dust all over the lens and you got to clean them. You just have to clean them. And I don't wipe them on my shirt. Some people do. I have plenty of cards. What did I do wrong? I only brought one camera bod. That was the biggest mistake I made. I should have had to. I was migrating from my Nikon to Olympus. I had just bought the Olympus. I had a Nikon and I didn't bring it because it was too heavy. I should have brought it or I should have rented another uh, because I was changing lenses in the field. And when something's close to you and you're trying to get a close up lens and you're out there taking your lens off and putting it on it, that was not comfortable. Um, it was clumsy. Um, I needed one more battery. I wasn't I never really ran out of power. But I got to the point where we got back to the hotel and I had to charge batteries right away for the next time we went out. Um, I shoot in manual. Um, I used aperture priority occasionally. I use the uh, shutter speed modes occasionally. I never shoot in uh, autofocus. Um, so that's basically, and if you ask me what, what my settings were in my camera when I go through uh, the photos and all that, I probably can't tell you. I can tell you maybe I can guess, but somebody told me to be prepared to ask what my my settings were. I don't know what they were. Most. Sure, sure, absolutely. No, no, go. This I want this. Yeah. Ted, if you could also repeat whatever. Okay, anyone I will. All right. No, uh, Martin was telling me about, um, okay, Ben Cat was asking whether I had trouble taking my camera equipment from one location to another. When we flew from one city to another, where we went out to the bush or Serengeti, Talk actually gave us a duffel bag and we'd be out there for maybe three days. So we brought enough clothes for those three days and I have a pull bag. So we had our clothes, our big suitcases stayed in, in Arusha. And we went out, we spent three or four days, we came back to Arusha and our big luggage, our luggage was there and we were reunited with our luggage. And then we took buses up to Kenya. At that point, 
again, when we went out to the bush, we actually took the duffel bag, three, four days worth of clothes, flew back, reunited with our luggage. And, but I never had restrictions on my camera. So I heard they had a way, you guys. Yes, no, we didn't have any weight. We just, whatever you could fit into your duffel bag was what we had. And we were on prop planes that held 20 people. And I had never been on a plane that small. That was, that was very interesting. Um, we had pilots that always had a junior pilot. And there were many times when the senior pilot would let the junior pilot uh, fly. And when they, he was changing flaps up there, the senior pilot would have his hand on the junior pilot's pants to make sure that he didn't push the flap, the lever too far. So that was a little disconcerting. But anyways, um, it oh gosh, I think uh, for two weeks, I, I'm going to guess I had somewhere between 15 and 20,000. Well, you had 50 some thousand or Martin had 50. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I had, I, I probably in the 10 to 15,000 range. So I, I took, I, I, I leave mine on high speed, uh, especially when something's moving quick. Um, I, I prefer to shoot high speed just because from one frame to the next, I, I, I think there can be the, the difference between a great photograph and a not so great photograph. So anyways, this is things I've done right and wrong. Our first park we went to was Karen. Thank you. And it's named after the river that goes through it. This park is known for its elephants and for the baobab trees. This was the only park we saw baobab trees. Um, the only other, other place I've seen baobab trees has been at Disney World down at, uh, Na you know, Animal Kingdom. Um, we also saw a ton of warthogs in this park. And here's where we, you're going to get the picture show. Um, lots of babies. And they intermix with so many other animals, you know, as long as they're not, as, as long as they're not eating each other or a threat to another, they, they, they all get along, or they seem to get along anyways, while we were there. I watched this guy for probably 25 minutes. It's an African bee catcher. Kept flittering back and forth to this branch, and I just kept, I wanted to get a bee in its beak. That was my goal. I said, we're not leaving till we get a bee in his beak. Well, I never got a bee in its beak. I um, probably, and and um, by the way, this was a private tour. It was my wife, myself, and a guide, and we had a six-person safari jeep all to ourselves, so we could stay as long as we wanted in one location, or we were bored. Let's go somewhere else. Not a monopod. No, I took a little four-inch. The question was, I didn't take a mon. Did I take a monopod? No, I took a little four-inch. Bipod and never used it. No. Uh, hmm? I guess. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I didn't use any, anything. And when you're going in those safari jeeps, the ruts, you are all over the place. If you're standing up in that safari jeep, you're bumping your head, you're being knocked over, all that. As a matter of fact. I probably walked a thousand steps the entire day, and my watch showed that I had twenty-eight thousand steps. <laughs> the elephants in in this park were just amazing. The babies. We 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 actually sat on a ledge for about an hour watching the babies and the adult elephants. Just play in the mud, play with each other, not run around. You got the elephant, you got the baboons, you got the warthog. They just all interacted. They lived together. They coexisted. 
I, I think the question is, do the family units stay together? And my understanding is it's mostly the females and the babies and the grown males, the bull elephants, come and go. Um, normally, we saw bull elephants by themselves. Uh, we rarely saw them with with the group. Uh, if we did, it, it was rare. Um, although we did see bull elephants, and they are big. We, I actually, and I don't have it in here, I have a picture of a full-grown rhino standing next to a bull elephant, and the size difference is absolutely incredible. Isn't there generally, is there a matriarch generally? Yeah, look. I, I believe I, a group of I, younger I, yes yeah. yes the question was is there a matriarch and the answer is yes from what I understand that there's there we go I guess I'm not a videographer but see the babe in the water or in the mud I see the one picking what we were told was is they're making sure that there's no frogs or snakes because if they get anything up in their snout, dead. Yeah, we sat here about 45 minutes just enjoying this. Lots of pictures. My understanding is for the sun. Protect them. It's, it's, it's their equivalent of um, suntan lotion. Yeah, I see. While we were there, the uh, baboons came down as a family group. So again, sharing the uh, the water down there, and the food. You just never know what you're going to see over there. It's it's not like a zoo where you have the little arrows that says this way to the rhinoceros. Is it? Here's the giraffes, or this is the aviary. Best time of year to go. You know, um, don't go during rainy season. I think that's like spring and uh, fall. Uh, because the vehicles, the safari vehicles can't get through the mud. Um, we actually went in January. Good question. Um, it had, we had rain. Uh, there was growth. Um, there were a lot of water hole, holes that the animals were actually uh, feeding and bathing in. So we ended up with the storks. So, you know, here you got the storks, you got the warthogs, you got the baboons, you got the elephants, and it's pretty cool. So, pardon me? How arduous, arduous is a trip like this? You know, some of them. Well, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the question is, is how arduous is the trip? Um, I do it again. I'm in my 70s. Um, you know, it, we flew from D.C. to uh, Doha in uh, Qatar, and then we flew from uh, Doha to uh, Arusha. That was probably about 15, 16, no, it's probably more than that, including the layover. So let's say about 16, 18 hours. Um, we got in three days early uh, so we could get our time zones uh, correct, sleep correct. We... You don't do a lot of walking on these. You don't get out of the jeeps. You become, you become animal food if you do. Um, I said I wasn't going to tell this story, but I'm going to tell the story. And uh, my wife is not here, so we're not going to get this stuff. <laughs> so there's something called kicking the tires. Hey, why don't you go kick the tires? Which means I got to go to the bathroom really bad. So. There's a tire on the back of the safari Jeep that there was one day we stayed out like two hours past we were supposed to. We're, usually you go out in the morning, do your safari, take your pictures, you, you do whatever you're going to do, and then you go back to the hotel because the animals are down during the afternoon. You have lunch, maybe a nap, then you go back out at night. We stayed out longer because we kept seeing all sorts of really neat things. Well, my wife and some other lady had to go. Really bad. Couldn't wait. About 45 minute drive. So they go to the back of the of the Jeep, and I'm in the back seat. So, you know, I'm giving them their privacy, and they're leaning up against the tire, picking the tires. And all of a sudden, I hear them screaming. There's a lion 50 feet from them that walked across the road. <laughs> Gosh. 
Uh, so, you know, of course, I turn around, I see this lion, I get my camera out. and. <laughs> <laughs> So they were okay. <laughs> Hurried them up a little bit. <laughs> so, anyways, that's that. That that was interesting. We 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 chuckle about that occasionally. So, uh huh. So, anyways, it it you're in the jeep. We we stayed at really nice hotels. Uh, when we were in the Serengeti, we stayed at the Four Seasons. Um, that is not arduous. In my opinion, so. Oh, I would agree with that. I yes, I would agree. If you have a bad back, uh, you're going to get bounced around. Um, I agree with that. I don't know the question, uh, the answer to that. I have seen YouTube videos where they have these. Uh, the the question was: Do people ever get attacked by lions or any of the wild animals in the jeeps? Um. I don't, I don't know. I have seen safari videos where they have these wide open jeeps, and the lion jumps into the jeep, and everybody kind of freaks out. But I've never seen them. I never seen somebody become a meal, a happy meal, so <laughs> or unhappy meal. We 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 did have um, yeah, we did have a situation when we were we were out. And they have game wardens in all these different parks out there looking for poachers. And we actually saw they walk, some of them walk around with guns patrolling the bush. Well, we actually saw a ranger running and about 50 feet behind him was a bull elephant coming after him. And he took a right turn. He being the ranger took a white right turn and the bull elephant ran past him. There was a second elephant coming after him and he started running again and the rangers had a jeep within about 300 yards. They took the jeep out, picked the guy up and saved him from the second bull elephant. That wasn't a lion, but that could have ended bad too. So they are, well, they are that and the hippos. Um, Again, um, ele elephant, love this picture. We were, this is not a long lens. I mean, I was from here to the window taking, I was probably within 20 feet of this. We were within a herd of elephants on both sides of us. We just turned off the Jeep. We, we sat there. They, they ate, they knocked over trees. Um, they meandered and we left after a little bit and never, never was charged. Um, our driver was always, our driver said he knew the signals of when uh, an animal was going to charge. We did run into an elephant a couple hours later that he was 30, 40, 50 feet from us. We were sitting there watching him. He decided he wanted to cross the road exactly where our Jeep was and sort of charge us, and we sped off. So that was the only time I uh, ever felt threatened by one of the animals. Um, again, I'm from here to the back wall. The, the lions, the leopards, the cheetahs, they were not threatened by the jeeps. As long as you were in the safari jeep, they felt you were just something big that they couldn't attack and wasn't going to attack you. Um, it, it was, there was another uh, adult to the right and three or four more uh, baby ostriches to the right. I just couldn't get them all in. Um, we actually have this on a canvas at home. My wife likes this one so much. So. So you never know what you're going to see. You don't know if you have the right lens on. Um, I had a situation towards the end of our our uh, safari where we saw a jackal sitting out, just sitting out, staring, and in the distance were uh, some some uh, Thompson gazelles. I asked the driver whether jackals eat gazelles. He says no. Ten seconds later, the jackal took off. After the gazelles separated a babe from the big from the pack, um, of course I have the wrong lens on. I don't have high speed shutter. I'm, you know, I'm on for just a regular shot. You know, a one two fiftieth of a second, and so I'm 
changing settings and changing lenses. And this jackal kept chasing this gazelle baby up and down in front of us going to our left, to our right, to our left, to our right. Mama was jumping over the, the jackal. Other jackals were running in front of other um, gazelles were running in front of the jackal. They were trying to distract the jackal from chasing the babe. And the babe eventually went down. But I didn't have the right lens. You never know what's going to happen. Um, I had another situation, what you'll see here, I did have the right lens. The the two, uh, the ones I had, uh, like the, um, the longer lenses, uh, you know, I used my 300 millimeter, which is really a 600. I use that for some of my takedowns. We actually saw some animals being taken down. And then the, um, I think it was an 80 to 200 or something like that. I use that quite a bit with um, our 80 to 300 with the uh, teleconverter. I use that a lot. Yeah, you didn't use like a Rarely. Rarely. I, I mean, I thought that line. Yeah, I might, I might have used the uh, 300. Um, again, baby baboon. They were cute watching these guys play. This was my least favorite park. They advertise this as the home of the of the free climbing lions. We looked forever. We drove to the park forever looking for tree lions in the trees. We finally found some in the trees, but they were way off in the distance, and you had to angle the car so you're shooting through uh, limbs and all that. And I just threw this in here. This is probably my least favorite picture of them. In the tree, three lions up in the tree. Not, not, but what was cool were the elephants. The elephants in this park, we got up close and personal with. And I love the tusk on this guy. All right. One of the things I like to do is when I'm in these, I'm driving anywhere, if I'm on a tour or something, I like to sit at the window and I put on a, um, try and shoot high speed and try and shoot things as it goes by. I mean, I probably get 500 photos and there's maybe five or six that are good. Maybe a lot of them are blurry or I cut things off and all that. So we're driving from like Manyara to the Nagorogoro Crater, which is absolutely wonderful. And this is just some scenes of what we saw along the way. Uh, this happens to be a laundromat. And this is in Tanzania. I have no idea what this is. I just thought it was pretty cool. I have no idea what these guys are doing. Um, I don't have no idea what's hanging from the the truck. I just thought it was an interesting photo because I don't see that around Richmond very often. Uh, car wash. Uh, again, I love the colors. Um, this is a woman selling corn in the cob. Um, then there's souvenir stands. These are your Uber drivers. You see them all over. They just sit there waiting for somebody to come up and say, I need a ride, or would you deliver this package? Um, they make a living delivering things, whether it be people or articles, documents. This is a Maasai family sitting by the roadside. Again, I love the colors. I love the colors. I love the beads and the Maasai. You'll see some more... Um, um, happens to be a fried chicken restaurant in the background. In Kentucky. So it was from the tour the week. Later on, yes. Yes. Um, so the building on the right is a, was their equivalent of a Kinko's. <laughs> building in the center is, a, well, I think they sell and service motorcycles. I didn't get the whole, I would have loved to have gotten the ox in this, um, but I didn't. I just thought this was a cool picture of them just taking the reeds. So now we're going to Nagorogor Crater. And in order to get in, we have to register. We have to stop at the ranger station. We have to give our name, our tour, where we're going, how long we're going to be there, uh, because they protect these areas from poachers, and they need to know who's going to be there and how long they're going to be. 
So, no, 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 no. If, if anybody gave him $20, it was the tour guide, not me. And I'm sure that happens often. So one of the things they told us is make sure your windows are locked. Make sure the doors are closed. The baboons will open your window, jump in, and look for food. At your hotel, they will come in through the, the doors, the balcony doors, look for the sugar packets, eat the sugar packets, and leave you a packet. <laughs> so they're very aggressive, very aggressive animals. Family. Big Daddy. Mom with baby, and you're on. This is actually a video. Video. Will that play? Uh, I doubt. Okay. Uh, let me do the same trick. Uh, I'm stop sharing, and I bring back video. Safe with the food. Um. Oh. There we go. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. It's not the the the, the zoomers. I, I, the question was, is how safe was the food? We eat no food that has not been cooked. We don't eat any of the fruit. We don't eat any of the, the vegetables. Um, we actually had one gentleman in our party got very, very sick. But whenever we go overseas, most third world countries, most countries other than Europe, we don't eat, we don't eat the uncooked food. Where is it? That's the end of it. Oh, are you? Okay. I'll try to run it again. I think it deserves to be. Yeah. Where's my mouse? We can just show it here. So we're we're sitting there waiting to enter the uh, the crater, and these guys have bananas on their truck. So, you know the old close your doors, close your windows. Uh, yeah, there they go. They're jumping up and they're grabbing uh, bananas off the uh, top of the truck. Uh huh. They're all coming. Uh, and I have it on video. Uh -huh. uh, basically, what you had were the uh, baboons actually jumped onto a truck that had bananas on top of their truck and started stealing the bananas and walked away with a um, something to eat. So, okay. I, I, I think we might have. I know we had to get shots. I'm not sure exactly which ones. So, the question was did we take malaria? pills or shots or, or whatever. And uh, I think we did. I know we had to get shots and there's a place here in town that when we go overseas and it's required to have shots, we go there. Uh, it's an international medical. And and I don't remember exactly if we did or not. I know we had shots, but I'm not sure if it was for malaria or something else. So. Um, I'll show you a picture of, where, of how we took our photos here in a, in a few minutes. We, we were actually in a safari jeep, driver, and then three rows of two. The top actually popped up, so you could stand and take pictures there. But many times, I don't like shooting down, so I would actually sit in my seat and open up the windows and actually try and get lower, you know, at, um, you know close to the ground as possible. Seeing they wouldn't let us go outside and lay on the ground and get eye-level uh, <laughs> photos, so... Because of snakes? Yes, because of snakes and wild birds. <laughs> Nagorgor Crater, this is from our balcony in the morning, uh, HDR. Uh, Nagorgor Crater is the world's largest volcanic caldera. A caldera is a collapsed volcano. This volcano used to be 16 to 18,000 feet high, 2 million years ago. Popped down, so now you got like a just a big bowl 
with uh, mountains around it. And it actually keeps many of the animals inside this caldera and they really don't join the, uh, the actual great migration um, because they live there year round. So the yeah, 20, 22 or something. It's, um, it was raining when we went out the next morning. It was raining, it was misting, it was foggy. It was hard to get photos. Um, got a jackal here chewing on a bone with a uh, wildebeest in the background. Jackals are the uh, garbage animal. They eat bones. They they eat almost anything. They keep they keep the uh, the savanna clean. A uh, couple of black rhinos. Um, I must have sat there for forty five minutes. They started off way in the distance, and worked their way up, and I was like, oh. and they got closer and closer. Oh, cross your horns! Cross your horns! Cross your horns! Um, I'm going to ask you, Fred. Crop out the antelope, keep the antelope, or the gazelle. Push your story, um, <laughs> it, it, it really is to show the whole, what's going on. You know, in my mind, I like the Thompson gazelle in there because it shows that you've got these two very large black rhinos. But if you look at the whole image, you got Thompson gazelle, 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 gazelle. You got wildebeest in the background. So, but I could also argue that, you know, I don't know, we, we couldn't figure out whether this was a mating ritual or whether it was an adult teaching a child, a big child, some behavior. Okay. Move gazelle to the right. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. I've, I've, I've gone both ways on this. I actually have this without the... the the gazelle in it, but well, okay. But maybe it's something. It it very well could be it, or as as they leave after they cross their horns. Yeah. Uh, will the beast? Will the beast with a with a young one? Sorry, they. In the Gorogor crater, there was, there must have been five, six, seven hundred wildebeest with their young ones. And the uh, males were around the females and the young ones trying to keep the lions from coming in and feasting on, uh, on the babes. Um, you get the gazelles uh, fighting. Uh, I thought this was interesting because this, this is what happens sometimes after a fight. You, you lose one of your horns. Yeah. You, <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. The comment was, it becomes a unicorn. Um, I love the, yeah. uh, the horns on this. I thought this, this is very unique. Um, that is a um, funny eagle. And the thing I didn't see when I was in the field, if you look at the photo, look at all the bugs flying around it. I didn't see that when, when, when I was taking this picture. It wasn't until I got on my, on my computer. Um, we actually had lunch prepared for us under a tent. I mean, it's like what you, you see in the old movies where the English are out there. They have a tent. They're cooking uh, lunch, uh, wine, soups, and all that. And the monkeys are sitting there and People are throwing um, um, bread rolls, bread to them, and the monkeys are feasting on the rolls. Um, a lot of elephants there, elephants. Uh, secretary bird. Uh, they they, they uh, mostly stay on the ground. They eat snakes, lizards. Uh, this is a... I had to write this one down. This is actually a, a auger buzzard. Again, you can see the, the bugs all, all around it. This was way far away. I had on my 600 plus my 1.4, and I had to crop this way down. It. I don't think it's a very, I think it's an interesting photo. I think it's 
you got a zebra that's been torn in two. You have two black mane lions feasting on it. You got one leaving. You got some females in the background. You have the jackals waiting for the uh, leftovers. Um, but this was, was way, 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 way in the distance. And the zebra on the right with its head up had just been kicked in its face by one of the zebras to the left. So now they jump up and uh, hit them with the back legs. This is a spurred wing goose, if anybody's interested. This is the safari jeep we were in. Uh, you can see how the top pops up. Um, you can shoot from there. Uh, when you're driving, they actually put the top down. You know, it rained a couple of times, so we shut down. Or when we're going back full speed back to the hotels, that comes down. You're talking about how arduous. He's 91 years old, the lady there in the uh, forefront on the right. He's 91 years old. Uh, her friend behind her, Rachel, um, was her guardian. Um, Regina, who's, who her name is, actually tried to do a talk tour in Athens, which required a lot of walking, and they sent her home. They said, don't come back on any tours unless you have a minder or a guardian. Rachel was the guardian for these, uh, the safari here. Um, Serengeti means the endless plain, and it truly is the endless plain. You can see forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Mama Cheetah. And the next one I call Lunch with Mom. Leopard. Yeah. Those are unnecessary. Probably from here to the the wall. He's actually up on a rock. Um, maybe a little further back, and I'm I'm using my long lens here. Um, this was later in the day. We actually went out during the evening hours. I told you we go out in the morning, you come back, you sleep, you have lunch, um, work on your photos. Then you go back out, and here's not hey, roaring, just yawning. Hey, and I think we have a video here. Okay. Okay, you go ahead. I, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, uh, well, you're seeing the here again. there's three female lions and nine cubs. And I mean, you can see how close they got to us. They, they don't care we're there. Uh huh. And what we're doing after the lions pass us, we get in the, the Jeep and we drive down about another 100 yards and they walk past us again. And we went down another 100 yards and they went past this again. Okay. They were. <laughs> well, eventually, way, way, way down by that uh, uh, tree line are um, a whole large herd of wildebeest. We ran into these guys the next morning. They were on the other side of a tree line and they were having breakfast. Okay. So I don't know if they had a wildebeest or a zebra or whatever, we actually read, and I don't have any pictures in here, when they have their... They have the cubs in the thicket so that the Cape Buffalo nor the male lions could in, get in there and kill the cubs. Male lions eat their own especially male cubs. We had a hard time getting photos of that. I don't have that in here, um, but, it, but it was 
they didn't have their eyes open yet. Three cubs, eyes weren't open. Mama was laying there sleeping. Just so the zoomers can see this? Yes. Okay. Now they're just past. You you know, we just we just drove through we had four safari jeeps. There were sixteen uh, fifteen of us. The four jeeps went in four different directions looking for lions. Once somebody found the lions, they used the radio and we all congregated to uh, watch the scenery. Okay. You, okay. I don't believe he was. Sure, with the with the rifle. I I don't remember them having a a rifle, although there may have been one in the Jeep that I just never noticed. Sorry, sorry. We saw a lot of lions trying to climb trees, especially the little ones. Little ones are trying to get the skill to get up in a tree. Um, Secretary Bird. We saw tons of zebra. We were not there during the Great Migration. We were there at the very end of the Great Migration. There were still trails of wildebeest and zebras going through the Serengeti and the savannas, going north to south, south, uh, they're going um, north to south. Um, we were no nowhere near the Marmara River to watch the crocodiles, all of that had occurred, um, but we were at the very tail end of it. Um, the birds there were incredible. Um, ring neck mongoose. There were probably two, three hundred of them in the background here. I like these because they were on the termite mounds actually, you know, looking for danger. Um, these were plentiful. You saw these all over the place. They were uh, lilac rested rollers, I think. Wow. You smell these a mile away. This yeah. is the worst smell and I still have it in my nasal passages. <laughs> Hippopotamuses. And you can see the crocodile down here in the front, but they stink. And their underbellies are all red. It was like, like they're sunburned. These are brown hornbill and he actually has skinks and snakes. And during mating season, in order to impress the female, the male who comes with the nicest assortment of gifts, evidently ends up being the provider and the mate of the female. Makes sense. So we had, there were three of them. I could only get two of them fairly decent. Okay, I've talked to Karen about this. And I said, I don't want to show this. She goes, you should show it. I don't want to show it. I don't want to put it in the end of your competition. I don't want to put it in general. Oh, you ought to. You ought to. So, okay, so we're, we're going to do this. So we're in the Serengeti. We're going through, and I go, all of a sudden, I hear our driver go, oh, my God. The honeymoon. I've only seen this three times in 17 years. So we got these male and female here just lounging around. You got the Thompson gazelles in the background. And all of a sudden, you got the honeymoon. And the male only lasts like 20, 25 seconds. And then he's done. Like in, uh, the, like in the years. And then, yeah, then you have the cigarette moment. <laughs> Well, they're together for five to six days and they don't eat. All they do is they mate and sleep 
for six days and then they come back to the pack, the pride, and rejoin life. So, you know, we got, like I said, the cigarette moment and then we got again. And then we got the looking, holding paws and looking at each other eyes. So anyways, I showed it. So I, I, I know, I know. Just met. I, I just don't want to offend anybody or I don't know. <laughs> uh huh. Um, yeah, you could hear them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I I I like that because of the bite. I I I mean, I I, I I'm, I'm stuttering here, a little embarrassed. But I have to, I have to say I got like 500 photos of this. But uh, these are the four that I think tell the story. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. So this is a reticulated giraffe. Uh, little birds. On them are, um, where are they? I got that. They're a red-billed oxpecker. And they actually eat the scabs and the bugs and all that off off of the uh, uh, the drafts. So re really a lot of the animals, uh, wildebeest and all that. You'll see these birds on there. There's also a yellow-billed uh, oxpecker. And they actually live, the yellow-billed actually live in the crotch of these big, of the giraffes, because the giraffes do not lay down and squish them. The red bill actually go up and sleep in trees. So I thought that was interesting that they have the two different type of ox peckers. And uh, this one, I probably threw it through uh, HDR. I mean, a single picture, threw it through Aurora HDR. Um, thank you. Uh, these are Maasai giraffe, and this is another one where I got a lot of photos, but I was trying to get that angle of the neck with the tree in the background. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm telling the driver, could you move up three feet? Can you move back four feet? You know, you know, could you do this? Could you do that? I'm going to get lower. I'm going to get higher. And so I got that photo and just something I like. So I like the angles. Um, we saw a lot of lions and trees in the Serengeti. Um, young guy, I like this guy, the one guy who, the young young cub down there. The dick dick, smallest um, antelope, I guess, in the world. They're, they're yay big and really hard to see. Our driver saw that. Um, I like this, but I and you can't pose these guys. I just wish I could have got both eyes in that in that rounded tail. Mm. So close, but no cigar. That tail's moving. Um, cub in the tree. Uh, wildebeest. This is actually a wide angle shot. I I'm not good at PowerPoint uh, presentations, so I had to crunch a bunch of these down. Okay, so we get a lion in in in. In here, and this this is an iPhone photo, and there's a story here. We're actually sitting here behind this female lion, and we're watching just a small trail of the uh, zebras and the uh, wildebeest migrating. Wildebeest and zebras migrate together because, and I don't know which one is which. One hears better, one can smell better, so they can detect danger. By both of them being together, so they they provide each other more to, um, protection. So just coming through end of the migration. Ah, who we got over there on the left? Kind of the old lion in the bush. Now the wind's blowing this way, so these animals don't get they get over to the left out of the picture before they actually smell the lion. Once they smell the lion, they take off, but they can't smell the lion because of the direction of the wind here. 
wildebeest coming through, and all of a sudden she takes off. And this is where I knew this was going to happen. I was hoping this was going to happen. So I have my long lens on. I have it at like one thirty-two hundredths of a second, and I've got my colors. All, you know, I'm. I think I got the colors great. I'm going to see a takedown. This is going to be great. Oh, I'm going to get this. And she goes right by. <laughs> she misses it. <laughs> she she did. I don't know why she missed it. There was a baby zebra that walked 10 feet, 20 feet away from her, and she let it go by. And she goes after an adult uh, wildebeest. I don't understand. Um. What I'm trying to show here, and again, this, I don't have the right lens, but if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, you see a, a gazelle sitting up in the tree. You just see the legs there. And we watch this, we watch this uh, leopard move this gazelle all around uh, the tree until it found that uh, location for the uh, meal. Um, That's a good one. I actually had this printed on canvas mm -hmm. and I hated it. Absolutely hated it. And I, I do one show a year and I took this up to the show and this is the only photo that sold. <laughs> <laughs> so the eyes and the beholder, I just, Oh, I couldn't, I couldn't stand it. I, I would, I was, I was going to donate it to Goodwill because I didn't like it. And there was a lady from South Africa. I reminded her of home and she bought it. Uh, warthogs, actually, the guy on the right, the warthog on the right, was actually trying to take away the female from the one on the left. And we turned into a little scuffle there. Um, crocodile on the rocks. Kenya, another tawny eagle. Um, that's Mount Kilimanjaro in the uh, back. Um, this is one of the reasons we took this tour. My wife actually trekked up Kilimanjaro. Um, our driver actually drove out of his way so we could get this picture. And this is an iPhone photo. I couldn't, I didn't have a lens wide enough to, um, I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> it is a bird, uh, the crown. Oh, so we ran into um, uh, ostrich they're, when they're next red, they're in mating, they're mating season. Um, Got a female checking him out, and the next thing we we have a mating dance there. So, uh, and there's no adult photos past that. So we go to Maasai Village. Um, I have never seen a dung beetle before, and the first thing we see when we get off the bus is a dung beetle. The only dung beetle I've ever seen has been at um, um, Animal Kingdom down in uh, at Disney. You know, they have uh, cartoons of it there. So. It, so the um, chief comes out to welcome us. They come out, they dance for us. Um, I like this picture. As you can tell, we're at the end of COVID. And I don't know how well you can see, but look at the jewelry on them. And look at look at their legs, look at the beads around their ankles and their, their, their uh, sandals. Uh, They took us aside. They showed us how they start fire. They talked to us about uh, the medicine man came up and talked to us about the different medicines that he made. Um, they talked about how the men have multiple wives. Uh, when they get married, it's up to the woman to go and build the hut because they, the, all the wives have separate huts and the male goes from wife to wife, I guess, every night. And the medicine man has medicine to make sure that, uh, Wire keeps the wives happy. So, um, don't know if he's got that license or not. Um, there aren't, well, there aren't enough men to go with I don't know. I don't know. I I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know why they have multiple wives. Maybe it's the wife. It could be. Could be. Well, we were sitting there while they were doing this, and I saw this dog walking towards us, and with its stick in its mouth. And as he got closer. There's a hook. I was like, oh, wow. I thought he had a stick. So, 
Um, of course, at the end, they have to put out a market and we have the ability to buy some of their uh, jewelry and goods that they make for us. Um, this is looking inside the inside the, the village. We were told because of COVID, we were not allowed to enter the village. We had to stay outside. And um, so before we left, my wife and I feel the answer is no unless you ask. And sometimes the answer is still no. So she asked the chief right here with, look at the pierced ears on him. Can we go inside the village? Because of course. And he calls over another warrior and he says, in whatever language, it says, would you show him your hut? Says, oh, great, we're going in there. And when we enter, the one warrior goes and grabs all the kids. Come here, come here, come here. He wants to take your picture. So I ended up with this picture. And this is our hut. They took us in this hut, and that's their kitchen. This hut is completely dark. I actually have my wife's light on her iPhone, and I'm taking a long exposure with my you know, nighttime camera on my iPhone in order to get this. And that's the children's bedroom in, in this hut. Now, while we're walking to the hut, I'm with this Maasai warrior who speaks really good English. And he's like 6'4", six, 6'5", six, kind of looking down at me. And he looks down and he goes, that's a pretty expensive watch. <laughs> and, and I go, yeah, I, I, I like it. And he goes, I'll trade you my spear for your watch. I'm thinking, first thing I'm thinking is, how are you going to power it? You, you don't have electricity. How are you going to recharge it? The next thing is, is, no, I want more than the spear. I want a couple of goats. And I thought, well, then how am I going to get the goats back? How am I going to get the spear back? And I go, oh, no, no thanks. But anyways, it was an interesting conversation that we had. And I was thinking, how are you, how are you going to actually recharge your watch? So uh, this was... <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to get that on the plane. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. They do have they they do have solar panel. They have one light hanging in the hut, and it's powered by a little solar cell on top. But it's like a sixty watt bulb, and that's all the light that they have in 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 the hut. Yeah, yeah. But but yeah, you went in my watch. Um. From Weavers in one of the towns, uh, this is take your child to work every day. Uh, we're, we're almost done. Um, like the flamingos, like the one biting the other. Elephants were, were fantastic. Um, Cape Buffalo. All right, this is our last video and we got one more slide after this and then we're done. So let me set this up. This is our last full day in Africa. And this is gonna be a very special day. We are going to do a sunrise, balloon rise, balloon ride. Oh. And nice. afterwards we are going to have a champagne breakfast out on the savannah. One balloon with 16 people and a pilot. There's four, four, pilot, four, four. And it starts out with the balloon laying on its side. And you're like the astronauts in the, in the shuttles. The old, so you're laying there like this, waiting for them to put gas in the balloon to actually, or hot, hot air in the balloon to actually right the balloon and then go up in the air. At least there you don't have to worry about the balloon power. I can't have it. Exactly. Okay. Don't know. So my wife, Rachel, 
and Regina, the 91 year old. So you can see on the other side, there's there's a group of four on that side, and barely see the other four on the on the right side. So we're on the right. We've been righted, and we're heading off the ground, and. It was cooler, it was morning. It was probably 50s, lower 60s, I don't know, 50s, something like that. We had jackets on. So we uh, go up in the air, looking at the horizon, absolutely gorgeous. Don't know if we're 100 feet up, 200 feet up, 300 feet up, looking and all of a sudden Rachel, who's sitting two next to me goes, oh my God, he's the ground and we look down we're crashing <laughs> so i i tell my wife i said sit down so we sat down grab we hit the ground we bounced up in the air we hit the ground again we bounced up in the air we hit the ground the third time and then we got drug across the savannah and in about, I think a minute, our guides saw what was happening. They saw us crashing. They were there to start getting us out of the balloon. And there was five seconds of silence. And I know the first thing I said is, I want out. And I heard somebody go, I want out. I want out. Then we heard people crying. We had people that had to be airlifted in Nairobi because they broke ankles, they broke legs, oh. they dislocated shoulders. Uh, <laughs> my camera, they told us when we go up, we should have our jackets on over our cameras. My camera never came out from underneath my jacket. That's how fast all this happened. One of the women who broke her ankle, I mean, it was a severe break. They actually had to use Maasai walking sticks to set it. They called the doctor from the hotel to come out. And the pain medicine he had was Tylenol. Mm -hmm. And she had a really bad broken ankle. They took her back to the hotel. No, I'm sorry. They took her from there to the airstrip because they actually flew in doctors from Nairobi. And in order... To get her there, they had her laying across the seat with her head sticking out one side of the Jeep and her ankles sticking out the other side of the Jeep, hitting all these bumps. And they had the safari guides there holding the doors open so that, anyways, it took about 45 minutes to an hour to get her to the airstrip. They took, finally got them to Nairobi. She went right into surgery. They spent three weeks in Nairobi before they could fly back to the U.S. Her husband broke his leg. Um, so anyways, the, she didn't even know that we crashed. <laughs> I, I That's swear the, yeah. what the happened was the age. <laughs> what Ra Rachel saw we were going to hit the ground. And the first thing Rachel did was wrap her arms around Regina put her in a bear hug, and Regina didn't even know that we crashed. Later on, she asked Rachel why everybody was so upset. And she, oh, the thing she said before that, boy, that was a quick balloon ride. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, no, we just came down. We, we, we hit, I think what happened was is that the people on the other side were standing up because oh. Rachel said, oh, my God, here comes the ground. We were able to somehow sit down and there's 
rails you could hold on to. And I think that protected us. Now, we were bruised. My wife and I were bruised. Um, of course, we didn't have the champagne breakfast. We all went back to the uh, hotel. And the first thing we did when we walked in the door was sign up for massages. So Betty got the massage first. I got the massage second. And everybody else said, oh, that's a good idea. And I think that really helped us. Um, I have never seen my wife had two double Jack Daniel shots <laughs> before 9 a.m. <laughs> He says we had a downdraft. I think he was drunk. I don't know. He was making jokes about how much vodka he drank that morning. You know, we got like five feet off the ground. He goes, okay, this is where I get out. You know, he's, he, he, uh, he had some very inappropriate jokes where people have never been in a balloon before. So on the way back, uh -oh. On the way back, I saw this. We drove by it. I made the driver turn around so I could get this. And um, I, I had that in the show. I think it got honorable mention or something. And that's it. Hope it didn't bore you too much. Yeah, thanks very much. What was the thing? Well, the, the very first park was great just because it was just Betty and I and the uh, guide. The question was, what was my favorite location? Um, they were all unique. We stayed at the Four Seasons in Serengeti. That was a really nice hotel. Um, we stayed at some uh, tents um, at one of the locations. And they weren't tents like people think of. They were four-star luxury tents. Uh, we would sit out on our balcony and about 40 feet away were elephants and rhinos. And at night we could hear the hyenas and between us and, and those animals was a ditch and electric fence. So the, we were no, they had a breakfast area where we would go in the morning and 40 feet away was the water hole. And I think we talked about this earlier. Um, you would get the, um, you would get the, uh, cake buffalo come in. They would actually drink, bathe, they'd leave. The elephants would come in, they would leave. Then you would get uh, uh, a lot of birds come in. Uh, you get the lions come in. And it's like they took turns. Actually, uh, all the rhinos, the rhinos would come in too. They were, they were very impressive. So um, I, I don't think I can pick one. I didn't like Lake Menorah. I would not go back there. So. So. This park uh, expedition seems like a more practical approach. It wasn't actual photographic safari, but you could do a lot of shooting. And did Martin, did you guys go on a photographic safari? And was yours, you know, like double, double the cost or something? No, I think his was uh, less expensive. He compared costs. So we paid about, I think we were 12400 each. Plus airfare. Um, yeah, you can do it for less than that. Vincat and I went with a photographer, mainly uh, to Namibia with the expand. There's a private reserve there. And we did five days, six days on our own, two different areas. Um, we were substantially less than that. But we weren't at number of days. There were three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, thirteen days. The thing I would say is, if you plan to go to Africa, one thing you can do is go to those um, restricted areas that don't have malaria. You don't have to get all that. So, if you go for that, it's usually on the western side of the bottom of the But, you know, every, every place is different with different restrictions, different rules about whether there's water or not, what kind of gear it is, all that. Now, on, on the other hand, if you go to Costa Rica, or at least tours, where are you there? But yes. No. Not just Not just happening. 
don't need you to get into specifics, but can you give us a general idea about how how responded to the situation? They were, they were great. They they actually had somebody stay with the people who were in the hospital. They actually paid, yeah, they, they did buy the travel insurance through talk. They actually had a private aircraft fly them back from Africa to one of the cities on the East Coast where they were in a first class on a uh, domestic carrier back to Phoenix. They were from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, we got credits for another tour. We got like a $500 a person refund because we didn't get to do the balloon. Um, our talk director who was with us was great. The pilot, it was about 15, 20 minutes after we crashed. And he goes, does anybody know the 911 in Africa? Oh, why would I know what 911 is in Africa? Wouldn't you know that? How do you train how to react to an accident? Or anyways, uh, we were not impressed with him. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know. They're still doing the balloon ride. Now, maybe he's not uh, actually uh, controlling balloon ride. Our um, director at talk said that the guy's been doing balloons for 20 years. So, don't know. Yeah. So. Colin's been there, I think. Oh. Well, it's outside of Uh-huh. Is there a moment over the Well, I showed you the video up front of the, the elephants, and although that's not a first-class video, that was breathtaking, and my wife and I think about that moment often. Um, the jackal taking down the gazelle, the baby gazelle. I didn't show that. Um, that was a oh-my-God moment. Oh, my God, oh, my God, he's going to get them all, get away. Or, you know, all, all four of us. Um, that, that was incredible. Um, when we were having breakfast at this tenant camp, actually being that close to the elephants and listening to them slurp the water, I, I didn't know that elephants slurped. You just sort of go, I've never heard that before. You know, I see them in the zoo and never, never hear that. Um, that, that, that was incredible. I never knew that that happened. Um, Every, every day was magical. Every day, something different happened. Um, we were talking about we had this power that somebody would go, I want to see a leopard today. We'd see a leopard. Somebody actually said before we got off the bus at the Maasai village, I'd love to see a dung beetle. And it was right there. I, I never even knew dung beetles would be in Africa. I, maybe I should. Uh, I, I mean, my... I said my exposure to them is Animal Kingdom. They got the little cartoons of them in the uh, Tree of Life. Um, it was, you know, maybe two, two and a half inches. And there was another one there that was smaller. Um, you know, for size, I probably should have put my foot next to it, but I didn't. Um, think of those things afterwards. Like, oh, my God, there's a dung beetle. So. It every day was different, and you know, you talk about it being a photography tour. Uh, there were maybe out of sixteen of us, uh, fifteen of us, there were maybe three of us with I would call quality cameras. There was a guy with a Nikon. There was me with my Olympus, and there was somebody with another Nikon. Everybody else was a little seventy-nine dollar point and shoot or or uh, iPhone. So, but. I did not go away feel feeling like I didn't get enough time to shoot. I had plenty of time to shoot, and I enjoyed going into the Maasai village and meeting them. Every every hotel we went into, we were greeted by the Maasai. They they come, they would dance, they would try and sell us trinkets. Um, that, that was interesting. That that really was. Yeah.